Well, welcome back, everyone, to the fourth in our series of podcasts on gamification and virtual reality. We're going to start to make our way a little bit towards the virtual reality types of questions. And again, our questions in this uh, program brought to you by the Center for Teaching and Learning at Humber College uh, have a lot to do with how we make these things effective for teaching and how can you use this material right away. So what I thought, I think we're at a point in our podcast where we can look at how you build some of these game systems and examples of some of these that are in use. So this is a a little, uh, a a, a little uh, from the Manitoba, and this is from the Registered Nursing Association of Ontario, actually. It was also uh, published across the country. This is our work developing a gaming application to help seniors at vulnerable risk. So essentially what happened is this is working with uh, Raquel Meyer, who is the director of the Center for Learning Research and Innovation at Baycrest, and uh, working in collaboration with her over the past three or four years, and Jennifer Regundan, who is their main educator, uh, there was a problem the Ministry of Health faced, and that was getting uh, updates to personal support workers and geriatric care nurses, how to manage seniors at risk. We spend millions of dollars a year right now admitting seniors uh, into hospitals and emergency rooms where we can do very little for them and they're sent right back to the nursing home, largely because the staff that look after the seniors have were trained five or ten years ago and haven't kept up to date with modern technologies and approaches to care. So we produced a game called SOS, which is a, s- a system observation tool, and it's basically a 30-minute game in which uh, students have to uh, solve virtual cases. So it's like entering a ward, you've got to take care of your various uh, seniors, you've got to find ways to uh, triage them and and move them toward care and make recognition. And there's a leaderboard that develops. And we've had over 10,000 plays on the app. We won one award. We're now up for another award, and we're moving into uh, uh, advanced studies in collaboration with several partners uh, this upcoming summer in internship settings. So basically what this gaming app does is allow you to practice being on the ward and the game is based on the fact that you earn money for each case that you solve and you earn more money if you take on a difficult case, less money in an easier case and there's all kinds of wagering elements and other kinds of confident sliders that are built into the game. So you can take these gaming apps and use them for education but immediately see them hit the ground in terms of Kirkpatrick 4 outcomes. The Kirkpatrick 4 outcomes I want to talk about here are notable. Kirkpatrick 4 outcomes are when you see the effect that you're learning has had in the real world. We can teach students a lot of things here at a college, but we know that they might like the material, we might know that they might use the material, but we're not sure if that made a difference in their practice 10 years down the road. Those are called Kirkpatrick 4 outcomes, and until recently we've only been really able to measure them looking at work by the Canadian Forces. Uh, People in the military are very interested (laughs) as to whether training in things like trauma management has outputs in terms of the battlefield. But the Kirkpatrick fours that we saw in this were fascinating. Uh, it turned out by using backend analytics, as we launched the app, the app had a huge uh, analytics screen so that we could see how long uh, users were playing the game, how much they were learning in the game, and it turns out they were having a heck of a time with dehydration. They were missing it completely. So because the backend analytics allowed us to view the dehydration problem, they were able to produce a variety of lunch and learn seminars, what we call micro-learning, burst learning, where in a couple of minutes we gave them the facts on dehydration, reviewed it, and guess Guess what? The admissions to hospital emergencies went down in the next quarter, and the, the, the care and management of dehydration was very high. So it's interesting, isn't it, that you can use the game not only to teach the material, but to also monitor how people are using the knowledge, implementing the knowledge, and see how it tumbles out in the real world. That's a great start and a great hook into our material today. We're going to talk a little bit about deeper learning in games. So well, let's have a look at that right now. So what we're going to look at here, this is a a diagram of the role of narrative in game design. And this is developed by Andres Marzowski, who is again uh, ranked uh, one of the top gamification gurus in the world. Gamification Gurus is a list that's based largely on Twitter posts and retweets and also uh, general penetration into the field. Gamification is used by over 40% of all uh, top 1,000 companies in the world, according to Gartner. 
Uh, it's a uh, $17.5 billion business right now. So there, there are experts in gamification around the world. We're interested in game-based learning here, where we don't really use those kind of leaderboards. But this is some fantastic work that's developed by Andrzej Marzarski on the role of narrative. So human beings are stories. Yuval Noah Harari uh, in Tel Aviv is a scholar that's written two great books. One is called Sapiens. His second book is called Homo Deus, in which he talks about the role of narrative in the human condition, that we are the only creature that thinks in terms of narrative. Now, I want you to think in terms of learning as a narrative or a story. And it might be a kind of a boring story. The boring story could be, well, solve this question and you get it right. <laughs> That's not much of a story. But the story could be something more complex, like walking onto a construction yard and having to get oriented to the fact that you've got inclement weather and yet you have deadlines to complete. These stories can occur in different ways. So we are human beings and we are human narratives. And what we can see is that most stories for, for human beings <laughs> begin here with this call to adventure. Remember the Indiana Jones movies? Indiana Jones went off to find this beautiful kind of relic. Um, and, and so then we have the departure, and he flies off in his plane with his pistol and his bullwhip. He's looking for the Ark of the Covenant, and he gets a little help, some new supernatural aid. They find out that uh, there's been teams digging for the, uh, for the Ark of the Covenant. He then enters what's called the belly of the whale, which is some kind of difficult phase that happens. It's uh, like in a three-act play, the idea of some kind of crisis. So we cross the threshold, and we enter the belly of the whale, and now we're in the initial which is called the Road of Trials. Um, and what we can see here is that we've, in building game systems moving forward, we'll come back to that slide in a moment, is that we used in our work in addiction medicine is the idea of recovery being a journey. And therefore, we built a game board and game system in which, by being on this journey toward abstinence or toward wholeness, you would aid in your own uh, journey toward recovery. Um, so we've used these elements quite a bit in game design. And as you can see, and as any good story, there was what's called the crossing of the threshold and finally the return, the master of two worlds. So this is where Indiana Jones is finally saved at the end of the movie, and he's acquired the Ark of the Covenant, and all the nasty uh, bad fellows are burned to death. So this whole idea that we think in terms of story, so think about game and VR development as being able to produce a story in the learning. To take anything which might be an idle fact, like knowing the number of vehicle casualties that occur in Ontario per year, and trying to put that in terms of a story, trying to put that in terms of a narrative that the student can develop, these learning narratives. So this is basic to being a human being. It's basically how we frame the world. There's a center called Narrative for Narrative uh, Studies in Medicine at University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine. And one of our colleagues, Beata Polowski, uh, who works at the Lock Shing Institute, is quite involved in this field. And this is the idea that we've learned, for example, in medicine, that if you understand what pain means to a patient, and they can write it out in a few pages, you're going to treat them a lot differently than you simply write down the word has pain. Imagine the story that you could go on as a new employee working for some place like Shoppers Drug Mart, or working in the tourism and travel industry, where there's kind of a story. We've been working with some students here at Humber in developing some game ideas in travel and tourism, where they have to kind of build their own little travel business. And they have to do that by being able to produce really good pitches on good travel destinations and posting the blackboard. And then other students can review their work. So it's the idea that when you make something into a story, and that story is compelling, and the student gets to play, be a play a role in that story rather than hear you tell a story, the student is actually in the game, influencing the outcome of the story, the engagement is really complete. It's just the way human brains are set up. So again, in our work in addiction, we looked at addiction being the cry of the soul and recovering being a journey that the patient uh, was, was on in this time. And in Baycrest Health Sciences, we had these little mini stories in which we had simulations of clinical practice. Think of every simulation you do in your classroom as a type of mini story. There's some fascinating work that's come out of uh, the um, uh, digital media world and uh, some great graduate work in the area of um, uh, the idea of player avatars and semiotic resonance. So I don't want to get too wordy because th this is a field in which is struggling to find its own languaging. But we found out that when a player uh, enters a game and plays a role in a game, so imagine you're teaching a course in something like chemistry and they play the part of a famous chemist trying to discover new formulas by learning them and being able to recite them in class, something simple like that, uh, they're actually, uh, and they become an avatar.
that avatar is kind of a symbol of who they are in the game. And it turns out people have an incredible connection with avatars. They really invest their personality into these avatars that we see in video games and in all kinds of gaming. And uh, this work has been, it, 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 it's got some great implications. There's studies, again, that have occurred at Baycrest Health Sciences where they had uh, seniors with dementia, with Alzheimer's, playing a game called Second Life. And that's where you go into an alternate reality in a computer game, and you can fly around a world and visit places and meet people. They're all real people, but they're all represented by avatars. And when they stopped the trial, the seniors were furious because Playing the role of the avatar in the game gave them a freedom that their dementia and physical disability could rob them of. So the, the, the possibilities for us becoming a character in a game or playing a role in a game so that we can view our learning in terms of stories, extremely powerful work. This enters into some kind of moving forward into virtual reality. We want to set you up for that by understanding the role of simulacra and hyperreality a little bit more. So hang with me here. This is kind of an interesting area that's developing as we speak without our consent. <laughs> Basically, a simulacra is a sign that loses its relationship to reality. For example, the concept of making America great again, or going to visit Disneyland, or of uh, discovering, living that, the good old days. The good old days, uh, making a country great, or the idea of Disneyland, are all simulacra. They don't refer to anything concrete. They're just kind of a symbol. Disneyland represents a certain experience for us. And so the, all of this early work in simulation talked about the fact that we're approaching a point now in our teaching and in our society, which is called hyperreality. So hyperreality is where the division between real and simulation collapses. And we end up in a space where we can enter the world uh, of virtual and augmented reality. So what virtual reality is essentially is a subset of hyperreality states. What we eventually, what we essentially do when we go into virtual reality is we have the uh, person participate in a story, however boring that story or exciting it may be, um, some of our work here with paramedic casualty simulations has you in a very exciting story after a, a bomb incident occurring in a subway car in downtown Toronto. And they've been working on the simulation for a couple of years here at Humber, and it's going to be uh, rolled out very soon with paramedics. So you have a little story element, but you're not in this reality. You're in an altered reality where the rules are different and your functionality is different. So this is uh, from a, uh, a great little uh, um, featurette film that was produced by a Japanese videographer called Hyperreality. And this is the world we're going to be living in in the future, where we are going to gamify uh, that is attach different values and progress values to each of our activities. Imagine a little voice coming on your headset and saying, why don't you walk the two blocks? It'll, it'll lose 60 calories. You can imagine this idea of assisted, of assistive devices and integrative wearable technologies. So virtual reality, augmented reality enters the space again for you to understand that these are hyper realities. They're synthetic spaces that we can enter. And in that space, we participate in a narrative, a series of things we want to do, or a story to complete. And we can do it in an atmosphere of psychological safety. Where this leads in the future is fascinating. Again, looking at the work of Yuval Harari in his latest book, Homo Deus, is that we are going to actually fuse with technology, and it's starting to occur already, and to produce what he calls inorganic life. That means that you're actually going to fuse with computers. Now think about it. Today our technology is fused. If you're a diabetic and you're taking insulin each day, without the technology of insulin production, you're not going to be around for very long. We're already somewhat cybernetic creatures, but this tendency is going to increase over time. So in getting involved in the virtual reality, augmented reality space, it's a little bit more than having a cool experience where you put on goggles and play a game. You're actually entering an element where your own thinking and the machine's thinking fuse to produce a different kind of experience we've never seen before in evolution. The fusion of inorganic life and organic life. I hope that this has been helpful for you today. Again, the takeaway point, human beings think in stories. And this is Pi May, my little character that we produced on the 3D printer from Kill Bill 2. Pi May says, no wonder you lose, you give up before you begin the battle. I can create a little story with Pai Mei with puppets, but if I make him into a virtual reality character, it's going to be a lot easier to sell as a teaching idea and a lot less humorous and ridiculous looking. We'll see you next week when we're going to take a deep look at virtual reality and its role in education and virtual learning environment design. Until then, game on.